The Citizens Advice Bureau offer free, confidential, impartial and independent advice from over 3,500 locations. The South Castephen Citizens Advice Bureau has two main offices at Stamford and Grantham. Gravity FM volunteer Abby gives us the opportunity to hear from some of the individuals based at the Grantham office in the Guildhall. Abby firstly talks with the chairman, Adrian. Adrian, can you describe how the individual bureaus are run? Yes, Abby. Um, All the bureaus around the country are independent charities, legal entities in their own right. However, they are affiliated to a central organisation, Citizens Advice. The important thing about that is that Citizens Advice as a central organisation is there to ensure quality of the service that we deliver to clients. We're audited every three years and we have to comply with what's known as a membership scheme which establishes the standards which our staff and volunteers and indeed the trustee board um, have to adhere to. That's hugely important. The central organisation is also there to establish things, for example, like training. Uh, Our volunteers, which deliver the uh, generalist advice service, are highly trained. They're volunteers, but they're highly trained individuals. And what is important is that if a client goes into a bureau in Scunthorpe, say, or in Lincoln, or in Grantham or Stanford, they receive exactly the same kind of service. When a client comes through the door to see us, we do not know what issues that they will be bringing to us. And it is usually the case that they will come with a whole range of uh, issues and problems that they're facing in their life at that time. It may be debt, it may be relationships, it may be about housing, it may be about employment, it may be about welfare benefits. Usually it's a combination of those things. Clients will be seen by a generalist advisor to start off with who will help them talk through their their problems. And the volunteer at that stage will then determine what should be the next step, which is whether they can be helped there and then, whether what they need is information that can be provided to them that will satisfy their requirement there and then, or whether they need to come back for an appointment for a further in-depth interview, in-depth advice, or whether, in fact, they need really specialist... One of the things like debt, or debt management, of course, that's a specialist subject area. Mm-hmm. So the volunteers always see clients when they come in and then determine how we would help them uh, go forward. Finally, Adrian, what would you say the uh, future holds the CAB? I would say, Abby, that we are going to see an increase in demand for our services. If you look back over the past two years, we have seen an increase of 22% in the number of clients coming to use our services. That is likely to increase. Second, I would say that there is going to be pressure on funding. No question about that. I have said that part of our funding comes from the local council, who have been extremely generous to us in the past, and we have an extremely good relationship with South Coast Mm -hmm. District Council. But they are facing significant cuts uh, under the government's austerity plan, and it is a possibility that those cuts may affect us as well. So we need to diversify our funding, and we're looking now at increasing the funding that we get, for example, from corporations in, in, in the district. Thank you very much for your time, Adrian, and I'm now looking forward to talk to your manager at the Grantham CAB and some of your volunteers. I'm with Sarah, the Advice Services Manager at Grantham CAB. Sarah, can you briefly tell me what CAB does? Okay. Well, CAB has two aims. Basically, we provide solutions to clients' problems, so we'll help them with with any issues that they're having a problem with. But also, we campaign to make changes. So where we identify injustice or bad practice, we will you know, campaign to change that so that clients now and in the future don't continue to suffer from that bad practice or injustice. So what are the most common problems clients come to see me with? The most work that we get really is around welfare benefits, very closely followed by debt. 
and we've also seen increases in um, employment inquiries and housing inquiries as a result of the economic downturn. People are losing their jobs, jobs are less secure, you know, people are getting into problems with their rent and their mortgage, etc. Um, and obviously we've seen high levels of personal debt. We've had quite a lot of changes this year that came in into effect from April from the Welfare Reform Act. Things like spare room subsidy, otherwise known as the bedroom tax, um, changes to council tax support, the loss of the crisis loan system, more sort of localised welfare. Um, those sorts of things are already impacting on our clients. The biggest change that hasn't yet been implemented, but we expect to come online at some point during the next year, is the um, introduction of universal credit, which should be rolled out nationally, we expect, some point during 2014. Universal credit um, is amalgamating six current benefits, creating a system where claimants will get one payment of all of their benefits, which will include their housing costs. And the biggest change really is that it will be paid monthly. And we can kind of see as a Citizens Advice Bureau the problems that that will bring to our clients already struggling to manage on fortnightly payments. Having to make your money last for a month is going to be a challenge for some people. So how do you deliver your services to our community? We have a drop-in service. It's, mm -hmm. you know, we deliver mainly face-to-face -face advice. We do provide information over the telephone. Um, through a sort of advice line, which, which is a project shared with other bureaus across the county. But as I said, most of our work is face-to-face. -face. It is a drop-in. Clients can come down during our opening hours and they'll have a 15-minute assessment interview with a gateway assessor. If the problem can be solved at that time, we will do that. If not, they'll be booked um, an appointment to come back at another time where more in-depth help will be given. The generalist advice service is mainly provided by volunteers. Um, we do have paid specialists in the areas of welfare benefits and debt. Those areas are more specialist and therefore require a higher level of knowledge. At Grantham we have 27 volunteers and we have about six paid staff. So, so quite it's quite number. a large number. Right. What is the, the criteria to actually recruit volunteers to work for CAB? Um, what we ask from our volunteers is life experience. You know, that helps you when you're dealing with clients' issues. You know, they, people, our volunteers come from all backgrounds, all walks of life. You know, and as I said, we don't have any set criteria. We aim to, to recruit three times a year. Um, we don't always achieve that, or we haven't always achieved that. But moving forward into next year, we are going to be much more structured in the way that we actually recruit to ensure that we have a steady flow of um, volunteers coming forward. The next recruitment drive starts in January. We have an open day at Grantham Bureau on the 29th of January, where anybody that's interested in learning more about volunteering for us, what we offer, what services um, we provide, and how they can support us, can come along and have a chat to some of our experienced advisors, talk to our management team, talk to members of our trustee board to get a flavour of what we do and what we're about. Grantham CAB is in the Gildall Arts Centre on St Peter's Hill in Grantham. We are open for drop-in services on Monday, Tuesday and Thursday from 9.30 until 3pm. It is drop-in, they don't need an appointment. We have appointments with our specialist services on Mondays and Fridays, but those services can only be booked after having gone through the generalist service. Hello Bill, thank you for giving me the time to talk to you. Uh, I understand that you are the Advice Sessions Supervisor for Grantham CAB. Could you talk about your role please within the CAB operation? Yep. Principally an Advice Sessions Supervisor supports the volunteers. We have three types of volunteers. We have volunteers who man reception, volunteers who do what we call gateway assessments, which are short diagnostic interviews, and then generalist advisors who conduct more full interviews for clients. I work part-time, that's three days a week, uh, a Monday, a Tuesday and a Thursday. And principally all that time is spent supporting the volunteers have you been affected by the, uh, the new bedroom tax and uh, are you getting clients to CAB seeking help as a result of that? I would have to run off a report to see exactly. Uh, it's a bit early to tell. 
We suspect it will be a growing problem. I know in other areas, perhaps more in inner city bureaus, it's more significant than here at the moment. But certainly people are feeling financial pressure all round. Things that we issue, such as food vouchers, we are the biggest issuer of food vouchers and that has steadily increased this year. So yes, you know, in answer to your question, yes, we're seeing one or two cases of the, the so-called bedroom tax starting to affect people. I suspect we'll get more perhaps in the new year. So apart from housing issues, what are the areas of the law that you actually deal with? The big three are benefits, debt, housing certainly, relationships, employment is a growing issue. Despite the government figures recently saying unemployment is going down, I would be hard-pressed to say that's true in this area. One thing that concerns me is the way some of the Eastern European people are treated by employers in this area and further east. One sometimes feels that their employment rights are being trodden on, but uh, we will we'll have to see how that goes. So what kind of action can you take if one feels that they're being, their rights are being uh, deprived, if you like? Well, it's important to realise that people in the Bureau, such as myself and the volunteers, we aren't legally trained, we're not solicitors. What we have is um, a collective of information which we use. Now that information has been put together at citizens advice level, the main organisation, by a team of legally trained experts and it's our job to help people using that. With employment issues we can point out basic rights, we can help perhaps contact employers via letter, but when it comes to the real uh, nitty-gritty of employment law we will refer on to local solicitors who help of course, all that is getting more difficult with the recent changes in um, tribunal law where now employees or ex-employees have to pay a fee, which they didn't have to. And it's also difficult because there's no legal aid. So actually enforcing employment rights for most, let's say, everyday people, average people, it is, is getting harder. I can understand to a certain extent why the government have tried to limit what they call vexatious claims, where people would just make claim after claim and, and employers were suffering, but I can't help thinking that the change is a bit too draconian and, and people are suffering. But we do the best we can with what we've got, basically. So I take it that uh, as far as the employment issues are concerned, you cannot take the clients through, let's say, tribunal process because you haven't got the resources to do that. It's something, I don't know about other bureaus, it's something I would like to see developed in this bureau, kind of advocacy, because it, it's quite daunting for people to go to employment tribunals or um, benefits tribunals. But yes, at the moment, as things stand, Grantham certainly doesn't have that facility and our sister bureau, Stanford, doesn't. I would like to think society is improving and that charities like ours don't always have to have more and more to help more and more people, but... I think that's a bit idealistic, to be honest. My hopes for 2014 is that we continue to do good work, we continue to help people. The statistics from helping people that we collate via our information systems and recording systems, I hope will, will be used to bring about changes in existing legislation so that maybe people don't have to keep coming to us for help. Working tax, child tax credit system, the benefit system, they're all very complex. And I, I know the, the, um, the changes as far as introducing universal credit are supposed to simplify matters. And as a purely personal view, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Um, judging by the clients we see and, and the complexities of the issues they bring, I think the idea that universal credit would sort all that out is a long way off the mark. But... Whether my colleagues further up the, um, the tree in, in this bureau and in Citizens Advice agree, I'm, I'm not sure. that but my, That's my view. Um, those systems could well do to be really simplified or run much more effectively. Um, we don't I'd like to make listeners aware that we don't design the legislation. Um, a lot of people come in very frustrated by what's happening. Our poor advisors tend to get it in the neck 
But as I point out, we don't design the legislation. We, we're just here, like, uh, picking up the bits and pieces and trying to help people sort it out. And from that point of view, I, I think we do reasonably well. I can see that it's a very difficult area to obviously deal with, isn't it? It yeah. is, it is. Yeah. We're actually having an open day on January the 29th. Yeah, January the 29th, where we're asking people to drop in on an informal basis. We show them the Bureau, we give them a broad perception of what they might be volunteering for and those who are interested we give an application pack to then we do formal interviews and we take a group maybe of six or eight people and put them through the, the training process and I'm involved in all of that uh, to some degree I mean obviously the trainer is the prime role in that but I, I support her because some of the volunteers will be working in this bureau and they, they will work with me once they're trained. So what advice would you give to someone who wants to be a volunteer? Come along and see us. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in a working day, I can't just drop everything and discuss it with people then and there. So what we would do is the receptionist will take the person's details. We will contact them. Hopefully, they would come along to an open day. We have to have set open days because our training has to be done in blocks to fit in with the Bureau. So anyone who kind of comes after the next open day would, would have to wait uh, unless we, we have some immediate needs. Uh, and can I throw in there, if anyone listening is really interested in IT, it would be very handy if you wanted a volunteer here to help with our IT. So yeah, to answer your question, we give them a perception of what the Bureau does. I think it's true to say that most people don't actually realise what it's like till they start working here. There's a lot of information, a lot of stuff to take in. And handling the public, you have to be suited to doing that. It, it can be very rewarding, but it can be very trying too. OK, Bill, thank you very much for your time. You have given me a fascinating insight into your role and the important part the volunteers play. Thank, thank you very much. Tom with Tom, a practicing solicitor who works for the CAB office in Grantham. Tom, can you describe what exactly you do on behalf of CAB and the areas of the law that you are specialised in? Well, uh, as to the area of law, the only thing I do for citizens' advice is housing-related stuff. And I'm particularly employed under a contract which allows the Citizens' Advice Bureau to provide what's called a housing court desk in the county court that sits up Harlaxton Road and meets normally once a fortnight. So, to outline my day on a typical Monday, I go in, meet the usher set up a, an interview room where I can actually meet people quietly and away from the hustle and bustle of the main waiting room area. And I normally then get a chance before people arrive to go through the court list and find out how many familiar names there are, people that I will have met before, and how many people are com going to be complete strangers to me on the day. And then, as they arrive... I attempt to get the story out of them very quickly and decide what we're actually going to do to be able to get the special problem that day solved or at least on a way to being solved. Can you act for any client that walks into the courtroom? Oh, I can act for absolutely anyone mm -hmm. as long as it's a matter that relates to housing. In other words, rent arrears potential eviction, uh, even when they've got a warrant for the bailiffs to come in, they, it's still not too late to make an application to suspend that warrant and see whether we can work out another solution that's going to enable the client to keep that house. Is the uh, legal advice that you offer at the court days, is it free? All the advice that Citizens Advice give from any of its offices is always free. We're a charity. We exist through mostly donations, but actually as well through some bits of uh, funding through councils. But specifically, all the advice we give is free. Once we've given someone advice, uh, when they follow it out, they may well need to pay out court fees for particular court applications, and they'll certainly end up having to pay whatever the debts are that uh, have got them into the position they're in. But, uh, no, the advice we give is absolutely free. Oh, that's good. So what kind of clients' issues or problems do you come across when you're at the court desk? 
We deal typically with the results of clients who may have allowed themselves to get into debt and have simply got their priorities wrong. And I think that's probably the phrase that comes up most often for me, the difference between a priority debt and a non-priority. Priority debts are the ones that can lose you your house, get the gas switched off, stop your water supply, or end up having you go to prison. So basically, any of those we can pick up and we can help with. That's typically local authority tenants, housing association tenants, or private tenants who are being evicted or are somewhere in that process of being evicted by their landlords. But we also deal with people who've got to the end of the road on a mortgage that they can't afford, and we're also able very often to assist with those. We don't often find people who are in debt because they've been silly and spent too much money. We usually find that circumstances have changed, and the typical scenarios are somebody's job was paying them a fantastic amount of money, and they've lost it, that somebody's job was paying them for phenomenal hours and they've had their hours cut, or that a family situation has changed, either someone has got very ill or a partnership has fallen apart, and for one reason or another, the regular routine of keeping on top of the bills and keeping the money paid that's needed has actually broken down. By the time we see people in court, very often there are pretty huge debts, thousands and thousands of pounds, even where there's only a relatively modest amount to be paid net of housing benefit per week. Every week when I've been to court, I actually have to fill in a form to explain how many people we've helped and what the court outcome is. I regard it as a failure if an outright possession order has been granted, in other words, someone has lost their house. I regard it as a success if we've actually been able to get an adjournment or we've been able to find a suspended possession order, in other words, an agreement with the landlord or with the mortgage company, that by arranging payments on a very different schedule, the client can actually stay in the house and keep on paying, the, paying what's due. So those are the typical outcomes that we hope to see. Very often, though, there will also be probably more important outcomes for the client's future, usually that they will have gone either to citizens' advice or to somewhere else for further action that's going to help them get out of the other problems that have got them into the hole with their rent or with their mortgage in the first place. Sometimes that'll be getting help over issues like depression, uh, a particular illness or whatever. Sometimes that'll simply be ta taking one of the options that's available through citizens' advice doing something like a debt relief order or even a bankruptcy so that they can actually wipe the slate clean and start fresh mm -hmm. without debt. Clearly, the more often a client has been in serious arrears, the more likely it is that their landlord is just going to stop listening to reason and try to get them booted out. Uh, council is probably the most socially responsible landlord that we routinely deal with, and I have to say they are very reasonable and very lenient but they do expect that clients will actually get in touch when they ring or write and that they won't just bury their head in the sand. So the worst outcome, unequivocally, is one day a bailiff turns up, stands on your doorstep, knocks, has you removed, helped out if necessary by the police, they take all your stuff away, put it into store for you and charge you for that storage, by the way, and you end up losing your house. That scenario can happen whether the landlord is the council, private landlord, housing association, or indeed whether you have no landlord but you're paying a mortgage and you simply haven't given the bank or the building society or whatever the institution is the repayments that you'd contracted to. OK, so what would you say your best outcome? Oh, for me, I go home with a spring in my step. If we've looked after a lot of people, and particularly if we've looked after people who came in and when I first asked them, uh, is yours a housing problem and would you like some help from Citizens Advice, when they've actually looked me in the eye and they've said, no, I'm having my house repossessed at 10 o'clock, I don't think you can help. When I persuade them to come into the office for a short chat and by the time they leave the courtroom, they know what's going to happen next, 
They know they're not going to get the house repossessed very quickly, even if at all, and they've got a clear course as to what they need to do next. That gives me a buzz. And I should think on balance we're probably able to sort out something better than half the people we ever see with a solution that will keep them in their house. That gives me a buzz every time. So I take it that every day is different in court? Wow, yes. Um, it's impossible to describe. Today we met nine clients in court. On a more typical day it would probably be three, maybe four. Once or twice we get above five, but it's quite rare. And sometimes we deal with nothing but mortgage problems. Sometimes it's nothing but council tenants with rent issues. And on a day like today, we've had a right across the spectrum mix of just about everybody. And it's also a strange thing to say. A courtroom's a place where people normally feel pretty traumatised, pretty out of place and unhappy. It's actually quite nice meeting people as one of the guys we met today. Uh, he'd actually come back for a six-month review and he was able to tell the judge with beaming smile and pride in his face that he'd paid every month on the button the mortgage that he was due and he'd actually been able to put a bit more over and above that back to the mortgage company. Does you good to go away after It makes you like feel that. good. It does. And you feel happy that you've done a good day's work. You know you have. Excellent. Tom, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with Amy, the CAB's debt specialist, can you tell us what you do? Yeah, I've um, been at the BRO for nearly three years now. I'm the money advice caseworker. If anybody finds that they are in financial difficulty, then if they make an appointment at the Bureau, what we do is we go through a list of who their creditors are. We look at whether they're a priority or a non-priority creditor. We look at their income, they're maximising it, their expenditure, what outgoings they have, where they can possibly, we can help reduce them. We would look at putting a budgeting plan together where the client would see what is going in and out. Sometimes it's hard to see from a bank statement. We would then, from that information, look at the options which are available to them so the advice would be tailored to their circumstances. Mm -hmm. We would look at um, whether or not it was possible to make repayments to their creditors. So we would look at if they had an available surplus. We could look at making payments directly to creditors and helping people do that. Or we could look at referring them to a free debt management company who would then proceed with giving them advice. Alternatively, we could look at other options. There's an IVA, which is a form of insolvency, but it is one which you make repayments during. There then is bankruptcy, or we do assess people's eligibility for a debt relief order. There's no cost to receive advice from the Bureau, or the advice is free of charge. I'm with Steve from CAB office, and I understand that, Steve, you also run the food bank in Grantham. My role in the food bank in Grantham is as, as the chairman of the trustee board. So, like trustees in the CAB, we're, we're interested in strategic uh, development and things like that, and making sure that the food bank will still be there next year. We have a paid coordinator that looks after it, but otherwise all the people that work there are volunteer people that collect the food, the people that put it in the warehouse and sort it, the people that distribute the food and uh, greet clients when they come in. They're all volunteers. So in many respects, it's a very similar organisation to, uh, to the CAB. As I say, the role of the trustee board is to make sure there's sufficient finance, so that uh, the processes run properly. We are affiliated to the uh, Trussell Trust, so we're part of the National Food Bank Network. So that provides us with a um, mechanism for recording the uh, food bank vouchers. So we know very precisely how much food is used and how many clients we see. And we try and collect the reasons why clients are in difficulties, which is why we get volunteers to fill those forms in. The other thing that the Trussell Trust provide is an audit uh, of the a process audit again, very similar to the CAB process audit, to make sure that we're doing things properly uh, and that uh, 
clients are dealt with in an appropriate manner. Mm -hmm. The food banks are there to help people through a crisis. Mm -hmm. They're not there to help people sustain a, an undesirable lifestyle. There is an organisation within Grantham, the uh, Grantham Passage, which provides a hot meal for homeless people or pseudo-homeless people every day. We're trying to prevent people who are in financial difficulties due to benefit delays or changes of benefit or loss of income from actually becoming homeless and certainly becoming, you know, not, not being able to put food on the table. More and more, of course, there are people that are actually in employment that have to choose between heating the house and eating. Uh, so we support some of those. But it's not an organisation that's there to keep people in food on a long-term basis. It's there to help them through a crisis and to make sure that somebody's dealing with that crisis. Mm -hmm. We also point people, signpost people, towards money advice services so that they can perhaps avoid getting into difficulty. I'm now with one of the volunteers, Cara. Please tell me, Cara, why you joined as a volunteer and what you get out of it. I joined the CAB this summer. I'm actually a law student at the University of Nottingham mm -hmm. and I thought it would be a good idea to have some experience working with clients and I thought it'd what better way to do it than to be helping the community. Excellent. So how much training have you had so far? Since... August I've began training so maybe five months training and it's been ongoing training. I'm still undergoing training now really, it's, it kind of goes alongside what I'm doing in Bureau. Excellent, so obviously you are at an advantage because you are a law student. Does yeah. help. So what qualities do you think that you need to become a volunteer for CAB? To be friendly and open-minded and to understand that you get people coming in from all walks of life, from many different areas. They can, you get all the sorts of people who just need somebody yeah. to help them, so it's definitely you just need an open mind. Yeah. And, and, and would you say that you're happy to recommend others who want to volunteer for CAB? Yeah, definitely. I think it's really good. I think it's really useful service, and I think that it's fun and you, feel, you get a good sense of you're doing something good for the community. Good. Well, thank you very much, Gara, for your interview. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm with uh, Bruce, another volunteer from CAB. Could you tell me, please, Bruce, how long you've been with CAB now? I joined uh, four years ago, no, nearly five years ago, actually, just oh, right. shortly after I retired. So you have plenty of experience? I have, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, what made you join CAB? Um, I just feel that it's important that having retired and worked and, to be honest, not done much in the voluntary sector, um, that I ought to see if I could put something back into society. Um, so I do work with CAB and, and quite a number of other um, little charities in the village where I live. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, that's important to do for me. So what qualities do you think that you need to become a volunteer? Qualities you need, I mean, when you do the training, obviously you're, you're taught not to be judgmental, um, the aspects of political correctness. But I think, I think you need an element of being a caring person and listening and also at the same time trying to get information out of people who at times are confused and worried and, and you can't necessarily always get to the bottom of what the real problem is. Um, so I, I think a sympathetic, at times firm, because you have to be sometimes. So if somebody uh, wants to become a volunteer, how much training do you think uh, a person need before they actually start advising clients? When I first joined, and I'm a bit of a, sort of a dinosaur in this, I, I had to go through probably six, nine months of training, but it's obviously changed quite a lot now yeah. because we've got the gateway system. I think, to be honest, if you're an inquisitive and intelligent person, you, you pick it up pretty quickly. But obviously that's the initial training. You do need then ongoing training mm -hmm. because obviously... Uh, as we know, legislation changes in all sorts of areas mm -hmm. and new issues come up. Exactly. Um, and so it's important, although we are supported by two very good websites, it's still nonetheless important that you, you do keep up mm -hmm. to date with, with changes right. um, in all sorts of areas. There is a structured training programme for volunteers to go through. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No, and I've, I've found that to be very supportive. And then, as you know, if I class myself as an experienced advisor, obviously you can then work with new volunteers coming through and at the end of the day it, it, it isn't for everybody some people may feel that, that it's not for them for various reasons which is absolutely fine mm -hmm. I think if we could get 100% through in terms of all the volunteers that would probably be unrealistic because there are pressures and concerns and worries associated with the job and 
it's not necessarily always for everybody. What kind of advice do you offer to your clients? It can be absolutely anything. I mean, obviously, because I've got experience, I can take on clients who come in for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you've usually had a chance to be able to research their problems in advance, and mm -hmm. so you're giving, giving targeted advice, which we may be able to deal with then, or we may need to send them on to third parties or indeed to the specialist advisors in terms of debt mm -hmm. and benefits that we've got. If we're just seeing clients who come in on a drop-in basis, it's a bit like being the GP, really. You don't know what the issue is going to be. And often you're able to help the client because that's what we're here to do initially, is to enable them to help themselves if they can do. If they can't, or because the issues are very complex, then obviously they'll come back for a further appointment, either with ourselves or with a specialist advisor. You mentioned that sometimes you come across clients with complex issues. So in that scenario, if you're not able to offer the service, the kind of service the client is expecting or um, should have, would you recommend or suggest local solicitors that you work with? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we've got a panel, but obviously we don't recommend individual ones. I mm -hmm. think it, it, it's wrong to do that. But yes, there are fairly complex issues, but specifically when you get into employment issues or family related issues in terms of uh, marital breakdown or partnership breakdown mm -hmm. um, obviously legal advice and also in terms of some contracts you need need more detailed legal advice because at the end of the day we are very much generalists although we've got a good depth of knowledge we do know when we uh, reach our limits what is the client's perception of you know when they're then getting advice from you I, I would like to think that most clients see us, see us as being extremely helpful. I mean, a lot of clients go out thanking you very much, shaking hands and being very grateful. Mm -hmm. There are some clients who, unfortunately, we're not able to help because we're not able to meet their expectations. Mm -hmm. Not that that's our fault, it's just that the system somewhere down the line, they're not able to achieve what they want to. That's disappointing in a way, but nonetheless, if they're dealing with legislation or benefits, for example, which they're not able to receive, then there's not a lot we can do about it. But I think the measure of success of, uh, of citizens' advice, it has much more of a national profile than it ever had when I first joined five years ago. And I think Grantham in particular has a very good reputation. And that can be measured really by the number of people who consistently come through the doors every day. Mm -hmm. To become a volunteer, you don't have to be from a, a specific class background. I don't think anybody can be a volunteer. Excellent. I think there is a tendency for people who are retired, mm -hmm. because obviously they've got the time, but I think that it's important that there is a, a wide cross-section of volunteers, because again, our clients come at us um, with lots of different issues and lots of different backgrounds, and whilst it's not necessarily our role to be able to empathise all the time, but nonetheless we've got to be sympathetic and to have an appreciation of the problems that they're facing. I mean, like you said, with Grantham is a very diverse community, and I'm assuming that uh, to cater for the Eastern European community, you also have got uh, suitable people to advise? Yes, I mean, there is, there is a, a phone advice line where um, Eastern Europeans can phone in. We've also got our own advisor who comes down from our Lincoln office who mm -hmm. speaks a number of uh, East European languages. And, of course, quite a number of the government agencies with whom you have to have contact at times on behalf of clients do have interpreters for, for all languages from around the world. It's amazing, in fact, how multicultural Grantham is. It's predominantly a white uh, ethnic background, but within that there are a huge number of sure, EU absolutely. citizens, and it's important that we can offer them as good a service as we can to, to everybody. So how many days would you say a CAB is actually open to the public? Well, it's open to the public for uh, three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, on a mm -hmm. drop-in basis, yeah. or an appointment basis. Yeah. But obviously we have full-time paid advisors who are here on a Wednesday and a Friday. So. Excellent. And how many days do you volunteer? I volunteer for one day on a Thursday. Yeah, one day a week I find uh, fulfilling and tiring. It's quite humbling, actually, to be able to help people who have... Uh, considerable difficulties who aren't be able to help themselves. I get an enormous degree of satisfaction out of being able to help people. I think it's great. And you would certainly recommend uh, others to volunteer? I would do because I think you, obviously you get quite a lot of benefits out of it personally and I think there is an excellent team of volunteers who you 
work with and who you know sit and share um, experiences and problems with. And there is a very good support group, both from the professional management and from the uh, the paid workers. So uh, I, th I think it's great. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bruce, for your insight. I'm now actually with another volunteer, CAB, Tracy, and Tracy has actually kindly offered her time to talk to us and tell us uh, her experience uh, as a volunteer for the past two years. So can you tell me uh, why you joined CAB? I decided to take a career break to look after my son, but I didn't want my brain to become inactive. Although I had experience in dealing with employment-related issues from my previous career, I was interested in learning more about the other areas of advice that the CAB specialise in, such as housing and debt and benefits. I knew nothing about these areas before. And what would you say are the most common problems that you face on a given day? Clients' problems vary on a day-to-day -day basis. One minute, for example, you can be dealing with someone with a debt issue and the next you can be helping someone who's homeless and has no bed for the night, so it's really very varied. And how much training have you had since you joined CAB? Well, initial training takes one morning a week, which lasts for a year. Once you've actually gone through that period, you're seeing clients throughout that time as well, which helps. It's not all just training. It's very varied schedule. But then after that, the training and support is available as and when you need it. I understand that you have two different types of giving advice, for example, a gateway and, and a full interview. Could you just explain on that, please? Well, a gateway appointment is offered to people that walk in from the street, so they just walk in cold. Our aim is to offer everybody a 10-minute initial appointment. Um, the reason why we do that is because we can often get through a lot of inquiries in a short space of time. Some inquiries can be dealt with in 10 minutes quite effectively, others can't and therefore need a longer appointment, which is a, what we call a full appointment, which would last for an hour. And that gives us the opportunity to really delve into people's inquiries so that we can best serve them. And what are the kind of qualities that you, you need to become a volunteer? I think really to be a CAB volunteer, empathy goes a long way. But I think the main one is to have a genuine desire to actually want to help people. As you can imagine, some clients can be very challenging, so patience is also another attribute that's definitely required on a daily basis. Well, in terms of what I get out of it, the main thing has to be the sense of satisfaction that you've helped someone who is in genuine need. The fact that you've helped improve their life or resolve their problems, it stays with you even after you've left the Bureau. It's definitely the most rewarding job that I've ever had. You can see from the vast majority of our clients how grateful they are that they've been able to come to the CAB for our help. Um, it gives you a lovely feeling when then you know that you've made a real difference in somebody's lives. Some clients worry about problems more than others, and for those people, you can see the sense of relief that you've helped to bring to them by helping them with their problems. So it, it is so rewarding. I'd urge anybody that's interested to come along and find out more about volunteering. I'm now speaking to another volunteer, Helen. Helen, I understand that you just joined us recently. I did, about six weeks ago, Abby, and really enjoying it. I'm presently working on reception. The idea, though, is to train to be an advisor, and that's what I'd really like to do, Abby. So you want to be a full advisor, or you just want to be a, what they call a brief 15-minute initial assessment? Well, I believe you have to work your way through the process, but yeah. I would like to be a full advisor. So when are you planning to do that? Early in the new year. How do you explain your experience so far? Oh, I love it, Abby. You Absolutely do. love it. You Excellent. just don't know what each day is going to bring. You're dealing with all sorts of different people, and all the other volunteers here make you feel part of a team. Jenny, you are also another volunteer for CAB. Yes, I've been here since 2009. What would you say that the qualities uh, that you should have as an advisor? I think you should have a kindly nature because most people that are coming in to see you are quite upset with the problems that they've got. You must be willing to uh, listen, give them time to say what they want, but also they may only be talking about one aspect of what their whole problem is. So you have to sort of learn to try and get information out of the person you're speaking to to see if there are other areas that you can help them with. For instance, you know, they might come in with a debt problem, but you then would ask them, you know, about they have children and, and whether they've got all their correct benefits coming in so we can sort of do an overall advice rather than just doing for the perhaps the specific problem they've come in with. 
And would you recommend any person to uh, join as a volunteer for CB? I think it's an exceptionally great voluntary job to do. It's giving back, being a volunteer. I get a lot out of it as well as hopefully putting a lot into what I do. You know, I genuinely care about the people that I'm speaking to and... You know, I'm very sympathetic and I try and help them the best way I can. And I think, you know, people are quite scared sometimes of coming to see us and it's taken them a lot of courage to come. So you you just need to be mindful of that, of when you actually see clients coming in. You know, I empathise with them. It's nice to see somebody that does care and, you know, we are here to help as best we can. I thoroughly enjoy doing it. I get a lot out of it myself. And I find that I've had troubles in my life and sometimes I'm able to draw on those problems that I've had um, so I can sort of speak from the heart, you know, that I know what they're going through and that I find actually helps people and they actually open up a little bit more because they can see that, you know, you you generally care and you want to help them the best you can. Gravity FM would like to thank the following people involved in the making of this feature. Abby, Adrian, Sarah, Bill, Tom, Amy, Steve, Cara, Bruce, Tracy, Helen and Penny. 